We share our first impressions of the all-new Subaru Crosstrek plug-in hybrid, and then we answer your questions, including one about whether a fully loaded Mazda CX-5 is a better deal than a stripped-down BMW X3. Next on Talking Cars. Hey, we're back. I'm Keith Barry. I'm Jennifer Stockberger. And I'm Mike Monticello. And we've got a great show today, uh, mostly because you're helping us with it, because <laughs> you sent us questions to talkingcars at iCloud.com. But before we get to your questions, we're going to talk about uh, a car we just bought. Well, you, you just picked it up, right? Yeah, so, you know, we just bought this uh, Subaru Crosstrek plug-in hybrid. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who, you know, are new to the show, we buy all of our cars anonymous, anonymously here at Consumer Reports. <laughs> Easy for me to say. Mm -hmm. uh, so we buy them all. So I went to the, you know, to a, a local dealer and I bought this car. Um, and it's, this is an interesting car because we like the Crosstrek. We've already tested the regular Crosstrek and mm -hmm. uh, we like it quite a bit. You know, it has a really nice ride and pretty responsive handling and decent fuel economy. It's really practical too. It's a really practical yeah. car, you know. Um, and then now you have this plug-in hybrid and of course you think in efficiency. But there uh, are some issues with it. I mean, the good thing is that because it's a plug-in hybrid, it has a, a you know decent-sized battery pack, so it can run for you know about 17 miles on electric-only range. And I keep in mind these are our first impressions, so right. we will verify how far it really goes, you know, on average in our real-world testing. But so you can do this electric-only stuff. But the problem is once you're not on the electric-only range, uh, not only does your efficiency you know, is going to go down most likely, but you're also, the car's dynamics change, you know, it's, mm. it's pretty quiet and, and, and pretty nice to drive when it's under electric power. Uh, keep in mind, if you floor it, it's going to turn into a hybrid and the gas engine is going to come on. But when you've used up, when you've depleted that battery, now it's in this hybrid mode and it's using a lot of, you know, the engine, obviously a lot. Um, and the continuously variable transmission causes uh, a lot of rubber banding, you know, that that sensation where mm. the RPMs are really high, but the acceleration isn't really, it's not really, that seems like it's correlation, yeah. exactly, yeah. good right. impersonation. Yeah. <laughs> and what's funny about this is that there are a lot of CBTs these days, they're going to uh, making these artificial shifts. You know, so it feels like an automatic, so it keeps having, bringing the revs back down. And Subaru even does that with some of their CBTs. This one doesn't seem to do that. Yeah. Mm. And so it, it becomes, uh, yes, it has the comfortable ride, uh, but, and, and actually one of the other things about it is that, uh, it, if you open the cargo hatch, there's, <laughs> it's pretty small compared that to the regular, that, that's, where the, that's right? where the batteries go, That's where the batteries are. And so there's a reason they did that. The reason is they wanted, Subaru wanted a true all wheel drive system right. like their regular gas cars. Now, a lot of, uh, you know, competitors like say the Toyota Highlander, Toyota RAV4 the Hybrid, they use, uh, hmm. an electric all-wheel drive system. So basically they put an electric motor at the rear axle. So it's like two two motors. It's an electric motor uh, and a gasoline engine and they're driving different sets of wheels. Right. Yeah. So yeah. the problem with that is that, you know, if the battery is depleted on that, you know, electric all-wheel drive system, you might still be just in only front-wheel front right. drive mode. Mm. You, here with this Crosstrek plug-in hybrid, you always have all-wheel drive all the time. Mm. So you have a real drive shaft going back to the rear of the car um, and, but to do that and to, and also they put the batteries back there in the cargo underneath their cargo area because they didn't want to do anything. They didn't want to compromise, uh, passenger space as well. So you've got some compromises with this car. Um, but I, I mean, I hear hybrid and I assume, oh, it's going to be. Uh, 40, at right. least 40 miles a gallon, but that's right. not the case, right? That's not what's promised. Not what we're seeing, and right. it's not, not even what's what promised. Yeah. Right, so to me, and I, I would just say, to this car seems like more compromise than benefit to that point. Like, you know, if mm. you were gonna get 40, you could say, okay, I can live with the reduced cargo space. Mm. I can live with the the CVT, the noise, the electric noise, and all the things that I identify. Noise. I've noticed when you're driving, very that, sing songy, that whine, yeah, 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 yeah. whiny yeah. sing songy. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah the uh, EPA <clears throat> rates it at 35 miles per gallon combined. Uh, you know, we got 29 miles per gallon overall in our testing with the regular right. cross track. So it will be interesting to see when we test, when we get our full testing yeah. done, what it ends up being. Yep. So yeah, I mean, I've driven it. I, I I totally agree, Jen. You've you've spent a lot of time with it, right? Right, and I I'm all about, and I think I've said on other episodes, I'm one of those people who I love all the advantages of hybrids or electrics, but I want them to feel conventional. 
right. to your mm -hmm. point. I, I like when they put the false shifts in. Right. I like when they keep standard gear selectors and things, which gladly they've you know done. That's in called this. a skeuomorphism. A skeuomorphism. That's, when they that's put what like I was going to say. That's when they put like an, an analog face on a digital clock. Exactly. Yeah. Just yeah. because we can't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like it. I learned something new with Keith every show. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if it's correct or not. We'll I, someone told away. me that once, but. But anyway, yeah. this car doesn't do that. Yeah. It, it feels very mm. hybrid-ish. Right. Um, be it the wine, the rubber banding, the lack mm. of cargo space, probably for me more compromise than benefit. And you don't even get the, I mean, there is, a, it isn't the same type of all wheel drive system, but if you're just looking to get a little extra traction to get out of your driveway, there's the Prius all wheel drive, and that promises, I mean, only a, a tiny penalty over the regular right. Prius. Right. And it has a ton of cargo space right. in the back. It doesn't right. look as cool. I'll, I'll go but with that. But that's new. That hasn't always been an, um, an option until this year to get exactly. the Prius all wheel drive. Right. So I, I, yeah, you're right. Now, true competitor. Right. The mm -hmm. thing with this car is if you're going to plug it in, you know, uh, all the time, then you're going to get some benefit from it, right? Mm. So when I, since I bought the car, uh, as I was driving away from the dealership, mm. at, you know, I get into the car and the salesman says, "Just, just remember, Subaru's not really known for their hybrids." <laughs> oh so, boy! Uh, word of caution. Yeah. Thank you, Subaru dealer. Yeah. Oh, oh my great. gosh. Yes. I mean, I, I, we love the the Crosstrek. Right. I personally, I love hybrids. I love cars that plug in. Anything that saves some right. fuel. Uh, but, I mean, as a combination, you know, uh, this ain't it, Chief, it seems yeah. like. You might just so. do it for some cafe points. You yeah. never know. Gee, yeah. cynical? <laughs> So, yeah, I, I, again, these are initial impressions. Right, right. Very so, early. Brand new car. Uh, so we're going to have a lot more to, to say about it when we actually test it. Uh, but now on to your questions. The first one is a video question from Pat. Thank you, Pat, for sending a video question. And you, you can send your questions to Talking Cars at iCloud.com. And Pat has a question about recalls. Hi, Talking Cars. Thanks for everything you do for people. I'm in the process of buying a used car through dealers only. I have found some cars I want that are on the recall list. Thanks for showing me how to check. As these are only safety recalls, I will require the dealer to resolve these before I buy it. Can the dealer tell me that these are too old to resolve now or that they have been resolved when the website says they are not? Thanks, and God bless you for all you do. So, Pat, to answer your question, it's um, it depends upon whether you're buying a new car or a used car. New cars can't be sold with open recalls. They, they have to fix them. There's no way around it. A used car, that's a little different. They have to disclose the recall, but they actually they, they can sell a car with an open, unrepaired recall. Right. And I think that has to do with the new cars coming through the dealership that has the parts, that has the repair, where a used mm. car may not be. It can yeah. be coming through a CarMax. It but can I be mean, coming through a dealer that's not they can still, the brand that you're selling. Yeah, and some dealers, I think CarMax is actually one of them that, that it won't sell a car unless it has a, right. the recall fixed. But some local car dealers might, you know, you, buyer beware. You do have to check to see if there's an open recall. If right. it isn't fixed, you can use that as a, you know, first of all, I'd be a little nervous about buying from that dealer if they didn't even, because right. all you have to do right. is bring it it's to. It's the right thing to do. All you have to do, yeah. you know, if you're buying a Ford at, at Joe's Car Sales, you just have to bring it to the Ford dealership and they'll fix it for free. Right. Anyone can bring it. It's not right. like it's any skin off their nose. So why, you know, so I'd be a little wary, uh, mm -hmm. wary with that, but you can use it as a negotiation tactic. Now, sure. as far as recalls expiring, right. they so never they, do, right? They don't expire, yeah. but the longer you wait, the more inconvenience it may be for you in that the parts aren't ready, readily available. You know, they have to order them. So the sooner you can get in there when they're in the midst of doing it for many, many cars, the better. But they don't expire. Yeah. And, you know, you just did a great story about buying used and making sure your name's on, your registration is up to date, your correct mailing, so that people do get information, particularly with a used car. Yeah, when you buy a car, uh, the way that that they that, uh, manufacturers find out that you have purchased a car from their brand is they look at registration data. Right. So if you move, you need to make sure that you update that, um, that address so they can send you any recall notices. And even then, I would check periodically uh, at NHTSA's website 
uh, and I think we can put that on the screen there, on yep. nitsa.gov, um, and, and look to see if there are any recalls. Carfax also has a service where you right. can put in, just put in your license plate, and it will alert you if any recalls pop up in your car. So recalls, they're important, get yeah. them fixed. Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of them lately. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we cover them. If you, you know, at consumerreports.org, Keith right here writes a lot of them. It seems like almost, yep. seems like almost day. daily. It's like yeah. 50,000, 100,000 cars every day. And it's yep. right. some, you know, a lot of the same parts are being shared of from different from the same suppliers across cars so mm -hmm. it's you know but it's good they're catching them yep. it's good they're yep. catching recalls them. are not a bad thing for yeah. sure right so we have a question from uh, William from Vancouver who said I recently Ooh. visited Japan and saw a category of vehicle pretty much exclusive to the Japanese domestic market called K cars I think they're extremely practical affordable and reliable some of the newer ones are even full of safety tech it seems to me that these are the perfect vehicles for people who are just looking for a versatile point A to point B type of car. The engines in these things are small, no more than 64 horsepower. What's your opinion on K cars? And do you think see these things coming to North America anytime soon? No. <laughs> Short I, answer. The answer is no. Yeah, no. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it depends on where. Where is your point A to point B? If right. your point A to point B is within a major Two city, city blocks, then right? then, you park then it, it could totally sure. work. But I mean. Yeah, we so the cars so. themselves are, yeah. so for those who don't know, who haven't traveled to Japan or seen them, K, it's short for Keiji Dosho, which means light automobile, and they're this tax code, basically, in Japan that taxes you less and charges you less if you drive a smaller car. So they're 11 feet long, about five feet wide, about six and a half feet tall. The engine has to be tiny, and you save some money in your sales tax and your insurance. But, I mean, these are... These are small. Also in Japan, parking is different. If you own a car, you have to prove that you have a place to park it. Some of these are exempt from that. So it gives more people access Again, to automobiles. Again, urban. Right. Probably in Japan, yeah. right? And yeah. and this this is a class of car that has been around for a long time in Japan. It's not like this is a new yeah, thing. Since World, the end of yeah. World War II, yeah. right? So they've been around a long time. But I mean, Americans have kind of we've kind of shown for years mm. that we don't like small cars. Uh, you know, take that as a good or a bad thing. But you know, these would be good cars in a major city. But once you get outside of the city, you know, and even and even then, a lot of our cities are pretty spread out. You know, if it's a very congested city, it makes sense. But if it's a city like, say, L.A., which is extremely spread out, mm -hmm. uh, and once you get up on the highway, you know, with so little power, that's what I. Was saying. Um, yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. I think you're not going to be enjoying that. Yeah. What know? do you think about? I mean, these are uh, anyone I know who's driven one has said they're great in Tokyo right. or Kyoto, but as soon right. as you get onto the highway, ye. When yeah. you say to me 64 horsepower, you know, or, you know, I think back of the Smart for Two with its 89 horsepower, I looked up, you know, just so disconcerting to enter, you know, a, a moving highway surrounded by SUVs, you know, it just, I don't think it's, it's the right car for this market, probably the great car for, for Tokyo, like you say, but I don't think it would, it would sell. They would sell some. Yeah. But. I mean, so Suzuki actually did bring one called the Alto to the UK, mm -hmm. and it didn't do that great in right. safety tests either. I mean, there's right. only so much you can do. I mean, you can put all these active safety features in, but when you've got that short little wheelbase and it only weighs a certain amount. Mass is yeah. mass. Yeah. They're neat little cars. They're <laughs> yeah. neat to look at. Yes. And, they're, and they're, you know, they're all different types of cars. It's oh, just, yeah. You know what I mean? It's not like a specific, it's not like it's just a car. They have little vans as well. And, oh, and there's some really yeah. cool ones in the 90s, the Honda Beat, the AutoZam. Some yeah. of those are really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Look them up, uh, but, you know... It, Go, it's a good reason to travel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ravi from Dallas has a question. I have a 2007 Camry XLE V6 with 130,000 miles on it. I absolutely love this car, but it started having issues after 110,000 miles. I had the dealer change, brake lines, alternator, engine uh, fuel issue, engine mounts, front struts, timing belt, jeez. And now they say the water pump needs to be replaced. I feel like I have to keep changing all the parts one by one as the car gets older. And these repairs are very expensive. At what point should I give up on repairs and just sell or trade the car in? Ravi's got a sunk cost fallacy and a ship of Theseus problem here. Oh my gosh, yeah. I gotta, where's my dictionary? <laughs> He's got his, yeah. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? Should he, should he keep this car? Well, I mean, at this yeah. point, it almost has a new car, right? Yeah. So, right. Uh, but no, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, probably should have dumped it a while ago. Yeah. Uh, once, you know, after the first major expense or two. Uh, it's kind of a bummer because usually started having problems at 110,000 miles. Usually a, a Toyota right. and especially a Camry right. is going to, you know, 
if you take care of it, could, could go to 200,000 miles. So this could be just a weird occurrence, yep. but mm. also know that the 2007 was actually um, not one of its best years. You know, right. usually if you look at our used car um, pr predicted reliability across the range, you know, it's Camry's, you know, top, oh, right. top scores, yeah. fives. That this was, was actually not, a four. Yeah. So, um, you know, there was, uh, it had engine major, engine minor, and engine, engine cooling issues. So there were some issues with that car, uh, which is just a little bit of bad luck that yeah. that, that happened, but uh, yeah. it seems like this is like this isn't just one problem. Well, that's what struck me is sometimes you know you have a clunk or a, a, a certain noise that you're chasing, but it's in the same um, in your powertrain or something. Mm. These are so disparate. There's like you know timing, you know timing belt, suspension, engine mounts, um, all charging system. It's not yeah, one problem right. he's chasing. These are all different. It's like the car is falling apart underneath him, literally. I had a so, car. Yeah. yeah, I had a car like this once, and it was. And, and, and it's not just about the finances. Yeah. When you have all these little problems come up, I had a, a '99 Volvo V70 that actually we we said was a good car. It's one of the reasons I bought it. Right. And just all these little things started going wrong yep. with it, and kept adding up. And and at some point, it just. It, my anxiety level went right. down when Am I got Am I going to get where I'm going? Thing. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So. And, it, and it's to your point, you know, even Toyotas can't have, you know, a bad year. They're mechanical or objects. Or a bad you know? car. Yeah, they're mechanical you know, objects. And a, we, we don't know. Run. Right. Yeah. And we don't know how, how the car yep. was taken care of and all that. I mean, you know, uh, maybe it was driven hard, but yeah. uh, sometimes these things just happen. Yeah. You know? My nephew yeah. is driving a Forerunner now that just turned 300,000 miles. Wow. Yep. Yeah. And he hasn't done hardly at nearly as much as Robbie has. So. Yeah, my so, brother has yeah. a Honda Accord with almost 300,000 yeah. miles. Yep. Yep. Sorry, bad luck. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes Sorry. you make the best choice and, and yeah. you think you make the best choice and it goes wrong. And you so. can't win, yeah. Oh, well. Uh, so a question from Mike. Many mm. sedans, CUVs, and SUVs have folding second row seats. My Audi A6, which is a sedan, has mm -hmm. these. The back seats in my Audi have very solid, strong steel backs, and they lock firmly in place. But when I fold them down to expand luggage or storage space, how safe are the front seat passengers from stuff in the trunk in a frontal accident? Are the front seats strong enough to withstand the force of the stuff we put in the trunk when it crashes forward into the back of the front seats? Jen. Yeah, so this, this difference in front seat backs is something we actually encountered when we were developing our child seat tests. Because mm. keep, you know, if you have particularly a rear facing child seat, it's going to contact that front seat back in a frontal crash. So the, the range of what those front seats are, you know, they can be very solid, as in Mike's case. They can be plastic. Right. They can mm. be just fabric over a frame. There is no requirement for what that structure has to be. Mm. So we have talked a lot about loading. You know, if you are loading heavy items, even in a sedan with those second row seats, you know, that, that pass, push pass, pass through, through yeah. um, make sure you're securing them in another way. You know, put a rope back to some something that keeps that them from sliding forward. Think think about <laughs> the the force, you know, if you have to do a full right. ABS stop or if you right. get or if you hit someone or if someone hits you the force of, of anything that's loose in the car that's going to come it's flying coming forward, forward, you know, right. and even if you're, you know, if, if, uh, if your head's above the headrest, then, you know, that's not going to stop it anyway. Something could still hit you in the head regardless. Right. So that's yeah. why it's so important whether the seat back will save the rest of you or not. If you're, if you've got your head above the headrest and, 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 you know, some object hits you, uh, it's going to be a problem. So you really yeah. have to make sure. Chances are those seat backs are strong enough for most things, but load, Heavy low and soft high is, is what we typically say, and tie down if you can. Yeah. Yep. Another question about seats from DK uh, says, thanks so much for your show. Mm. How do anti-whiplash yep. front seats affect rear seat occupants, infants and child seats, or children in booster seats, especially in compact sedans or SUVs where there's maybe 30 inches between the front and rear headrests? Mm. I'm pretty tall, so my seat is always set to its rearmost position. So those anti-whiplash seats. Right. So there's explain two. Explain what those are. So there's yeah. really two kind of technologies that are anti-whiplash. Mm. The first is called active head restraints. Most of them are mechanical in that when your lumbar area goes backward in a, in a crash, it pushes the rear head restraint actually forward. Mm. So it, it lowers what they call the back set. Your, your neck doesn't snap back quite as far because your head restraints come forward. So that's the first. So obviously that's not affecting anybody in the rear. The others 
our anti-whiplash technology, kind of like Volvo's WHIPS system, their, their whiplash protection system. In that case, not only is that front head restraint and front seat back coming up and forward a little bit, but then it goes back a bit mm. um, to kind of cradle you and, and let some of that energy absorb before you snap yourself back forward, which is where the whiplash comes. But those distances, to answer um, the question, aren't really intruding into the rear passenger area sufficiently that there's cause for concern. So moving like so, it's right. not going to hit. Right. The, it's not going to hit the person behind the, right. or the or the child. Behind. And keep in mind, they're moving backwards too. Mm. You know, everything's going to move towards the impact. So in a rear crash, everybody's moving backwards at pretty much the same rate. Um, there have been stories of seatbacks failing, however, which is maybe where this question comes from, and literally the front occupant folding into the child child and her mm. actually hitting their head. Um, so there's been those stories out there that's not from the whiplash It's kind systems. of interesting. Maybe there should start to be some requirements on, uh, on seat backs, you Correct. know, uh, whether, whether they're, they should all be hard plastic backs or, or, or something like that, you know, with particularly because they are an impact point yeah. for a yeah, kid. Absolutely. So we've advocated for all of this and, you know, there's this whole push in industry, in policy areas, legislature, that we need to start looking at that rear seat. We've done so much to protect front, front seat occupants. We need to bring it to the back and, and put some of those advances. Yeah, especially, be it retentioners, load limiters, yeah, some you know, sort of airbag. It's not even required bag. to have a, ten, a seat belt tensioner back there. No, mm -hmm. no. So we've talked about that. I think I'm that. in the yeah. back of a, you know, a Lyft or an Uber or something, or right. you put kids back there. Yep. The back seat is it's important. It's furthest from the impact, but it's time to move back there and put some technology back there, yeah. for sure. Next question is from Spiro, uh, who says, if you were buying a car, would you prefer a fully loaded Mazda CX-5, around $37,000, or not so loaded but new, BMW X3, around $42,000, $44,000? Is a fully loaded Mazda CX-5 at least equal to a lower-end BMW X3, or is the luxury class in a different league? This is a nice philosophical. This is a, a really interesting question. I like it. Story. Really interesting. You've oh, got a great story. Let's go with yeah. it. No, no, that I absolutely just got this question, but it was Q5. Mm. So I have a friend who literally Audi texted Q5. me. She's driving a Q5. I love it, but I'm looking for something less expensive. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in what you have to say because I'll tell you what my advice. Is. Well, what's interesting I about that is that you know. Uh, Mazda is kind of like this, you know, a less expensive BMW. You know, that's kind of mm -hmm. what what Mazda We've made that is. Yeah. yeah, and so it's interesting that this person, you know, is thinking, well, what what if I got the full blown version, you know, high zoot version of the CX-5? <laughs> how does that compare to the X3? And uh, you know, I'm torn myself. Uh, I would, you know, if you if you get the higher level CX-5s, then you get the 2.5 liter turbo four cylinder, which has uh, 227 horsepower which is still a little less than uh, the X3's um, 248 horsepower turbo four cylinder. But uh, we've driven it and we haven't tested that, that CX-5 with that engine. But We got um, some time with it. We got yeah. some time with it. And you know, the Mazda's interior, the CX-5's interior is so nice these days uh, and you get so many things. You know, you have, um, you, of course you get uh, AEB with pedestrian detection, uh, blind spot warning, rear cross traffic warning, adaptive cruise control, then things like Apple CarPlay and Android Auto come standard on the top version. And BMW um, actually charges you a subscription for, for Apple CarPlay and doesn't even offer Android right. Auto. Right, ventilated yeah. front seats, heated rear seats, heated steering wheel. You're, and if you, if you look at the X3 you know, uh, with all-wheel drive, uh, then now you're looking at about a $6,000 difference just to start. And BMW's kind of known for making you pay extra for things. So uh, mm. here's what I would say. The BMW is gonna be probably a better driving machine but <laughs> i like you know in terms of just the handling and and stuff like that mm. and the way the drivetrain works but i'd save the money and and have a version because the x3 is going to feel a little um you know like you missed some some features right yeah. you're you're missing some features with that you know when you start just at the base version whereas the cx5 is going to feel completely luxurious and loaded and you're saving money doing it, and it still is a, a great driving vehicle. So personally, I'd go with the CX-5. Which was exactly what I told her. So, and yeah. she didn't throw, she had thrown out, you know, Lexus NX, and should I look at some others? I said, why don't you look at a loaded Mazda CX-5 instead of Audi or anything like that? And I, CX-5, excellent reliability. Yes, it's super that's true. reliable. Yep. BMW? Average. Average. So you're going to probably have less problems with it 
be super happy. I would totally go. Yeah, I actually mm -hmm. did the same thing. A, a yep. buddy of mine from college, he asked me as his wife was looking for a new vehicle, and he said, well, you know, what about this one, this one, this one? And I said, you know, uh, well, you know, also definitely go try the Mazda CX-5. They went and drove it that day. They bought it that day. Yes. <laughs> nice. Because it has sporty character yeah. of those mainstream, I'll you, say, mainstream you've got to drive SUVs. It. Yeah. And it's, as far as the, the philosophy yep. is concerned, this one's a little tough because it's it's putting two really great cars against right. it. Right. And then the Mazda CX-5 really kind of out outclasses. Uh, I mean, it would be a different story if we were talking about another loaded uh, non-luxury car. Right. I think there's another option. Um, and that is looking at, at sort of a certified pre-owned or a, a used car with some warranty because those luxury cars tend right. to depreciate faster yep. and more. So if you were to look at maybe uh, an off-lease X3, you just got to make sure that you have all those safety features because right. they might not they might not right. be there. Well, they weren't standard. <clears throat> they weren't they, standard. Up until this coming right. model exactly. year. So, right. yeah. um, and some of the same infotainment uh, yep. system features, especially with something like the Q5, the last gen Q5's in infotainment was like out of the Stone Age. So, <laughs> So, um, but if you go back two years, you might be able to take, someone else right. took the depreciation hit and then you can get the kind of, right. uh, the little intangibles of the, of the luxury. Yep. Right. Um, but you know, don't buy based on the badge, buy based on the, on the car. Great yep. advice. Yeah. 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 So we have one last question and it's from Ari from Florida who mm -hmm. says, I have a five-year-old daughter. According to state law, uh, children need to be in the back seat until a certain age. I was wondering if there were any exceptions for two-seat cars. I'm assuming that Arif's car is a two-seater, and that's why there's this question. And that's why he's asking. Yeah. So my investigation was, in Florida, very much like the state of Connecticut and many other states, the law doesn't actually state that kids have to be in the back seat. It says they have to be in the appropriate child restraint, but it doesn't necessarily say they have to be in the back seat. Now, I will say that is the recommended spot for safety. Mm. Uh, you know, they, if you have a back seat, put them back there. But even when seats ha or even when states have rear seat laws, they often say if available. So to answer Arif's question specifically, if you only have two seats, they are very much allowed to be in the front seat. If it's a rear facing, which a five-year-old would not, you want to make sure the airbag is off that front airbag in that passenger seat. For a forward facing child, which his five-year-old probably is either harnessed or in a booster seat, push that front seat back all the way mm -hmm. back, give them the most seat room to that airbag, but leave the airbag on. They're showing that booster age kids are actually getting some advantage, some research <laughs> from the airbags, um, and obviously make sure they're belted if in a booster and make sure the child seat's secure if they're still in a child seat. How and, awesome is it having a yeah. child seat expert on our show? Seriously, yeah. <laughs> I have a, we just had a, a coworker just had a kid and and, uh, and we had experts go and install that child seat for the first time, <laughs> right. which is pretty cool. Yep. Yeah. Um, is there a difference between the age of the car? Let's say this is like a, an, an older vehicle with airbags. That so what be... you'll see is a difference in how you shut off the airbag. So early roadsters mm -hmm. would have literally you would put a key in and it's mm, a manual shut off to say airbag off right. and that may be in the glove box more you know more current model vehicles are actually measuring that there's a, a child there they will shut off that front passenger airbag even for petite adults sometimes because mm. their weight's not enough yeah it's measuring the, the weight feels. right it measures the weight okay. and the distribution of the oh, weight okay. so it knows a person a child seat is there and will automatically I'll say passenger airbag off I will sometimes get it if I put a briefcase or something yeah. or a bag on that passenger I've never seat. seen you carry a briefcase. I do have a briefcase. It's oh. just a fashionable one. Oh, okay. <laughs> excuse me. You wouldn't even notice it. <laughs> I'm thinking the old yeah, school. Yeah, the old school. Yeah. The Halliburton with yes. dollar bills inside. With my yeah. horn rim glasses <laughs> and my tie. Yeah. All right. That's enough. Uh, <laughs> if you have any questions for us, We'll answer them, sending, send them to talkingcars at iCloud.com. If there's a question you have asked us, we're going to get to it as soon as possible. Thanks so much. Check out consumerreports.org for the show notes, and we'll talk to you soon.